Good evening. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to uh, Car Church tonight. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, or maybe I should say in the car of the Lord, and uh, thankful to be with you tonight. Uh, I've asked Rebecca to uh, post uh, our scriptures for this evening, so she'll be putting those up fairly soon, and hopefully you can jot those down or at least follow along as we go through this evening's teaching. And tonight we're going to start out in the book of Matthew, and we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 20. Uh, I'm flying solo tonight. Uh, Patty's at home with my daughter who's visiting from Jackson. And uh, so I'm here alone tonight. So I'm going to open us up with prayer. And uh, tonight's message, we're calling it Descent into Glory. And I think as we go along through this evening's teaching, you'll start to really understand what that means. But let's just open up tonight with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. Your word is so alive. It's so amazing. Uh, Father, there's so much here that we can spend a thousand lifetimes and never fully uh, cover the depth and the wonders of your word. But I'm so thankful tonight, Lord, that we have the privilege of, of touching on a portion of your word tonight together. I just pray for wisdom for me and, Lord, that as I seek to impart what you've kind of spoken into my spirit tonight, that you would give us uh, ears to hear, minds that can understand, and just give us a, a will to want to be a part of what you're doing in this day. And Lord, I thank you for that in advance. I thank you because I know you're here with us. I pray for that wall of fire that uh, Zechariah talks about and your glory in our midst to be here tonight. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want us to start tonight in Matthew, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 20. Again, I'm calling tonight Descent into Glory. And uh, I want us to look at a very familiar, several very familiar verses of Scripture. But I want us to look at it again with fresh eyes and specifically in regards to this template or paradigm shift that we've been talking about, uh, the difference between me living my life for Christ versus the idea of Christ living his life in and through me. That paradigm shift is critical to all that we've been talking about for many weeks now. But I want us to look particularly here at Matthew. And looking in Matthew verse chapter 20, verse 25, just to put a little context here, uh, Zebedee's wife, uh, the mother of James and John, has approached Jesus and asked if her sons can sit on his left and on his right in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says, I don't know if you know what you're asking for. Um, are they willing to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And they say that they are. And then it creates a little bit of a stir among the disciples that these two guys are kind of fighting for a position of greatness. We're talking about greatness or glory. And we're talking about this idea of descending or a descent into glory. And notice what happens here in verse 25. It says, but Jesus called them to himself and he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Before I look into that a little deeper, I want you to look at with me at a couple of verses where this same uh, idea is, is considered. Look at Mark chapter 9. If you look at Mark chapter 9, and I'm going to look at verse 33. Mark 9 verse 33, it says, Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it that you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Again, this idea of descent into glory. 
But we're going to talk about this in a brand new, fresh way. But just continue with me for a minute. Look over at Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, verse 42. Again, this is a repeat of, of Matthew. Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires uh, to be first shall, or rather whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now just hold in here with me. Look, for example, over at Luke 22. Luke 22 and verse 24. Luke 22, verse 24, again, the same idea is being talked about here. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Now these, Luke records this with some additional input. He said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. Uh, but you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon me. So again, we see this idea of a descent into greatness. If you want to be great, it has to do with service. If you want to be first, it has to do with becoming the greatest servant. Now, I want to say something here that's very critical to the revelation I hope you'll get tonight. I want you to go back to Matthew 20 with me for a minute. Matthew 20, where we began. And I want you to see, in essence, kind of a picture here of three ideas about greatness or about glory. The first one has to do with what I would call lording it over. It's a picture of a person trying to establish their own glory. Notice how it says it there in verse 25 of Matthew 20. You know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise of authority over them. Here we see the picture of someone going about, in essence, to establish their own glory by uh, controlling situations or controlling uh, circumstances in order to try and bring about their own authority, bring about their own glory, bring about their own uh, greatness, if you will. And so they've taken upon themselves to go about to establish their own greatness by exercising um, and lording it over another person. A second picture here that if we're not careful, we might think this passage of scripture is suggesting we should do is what I would call becoming the servant of everyone. Now listen to those words. Words are very important to me. Becoming the servant of everyone. For example, it says here, it should not be so among you. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first or the greatest, let him be your slave. For just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. One idea is that the, the road to glory or to greatness is to take charge of of your own glory, your own greatness, and to lord it over someone, and to use and establish people to help you accomplish your glory. A second is, in a sense, kind of just exactly the opposite of that, which is that you lay down all of your own ideas and become the servant of everyone, that everyone is who you serve, and that Whatever others think of you, whatever others establishes what you should be doing, whatever others determine is the, the source of, of what will make you what you're supposed to be, you become the servant of everyone. And it might seem as though that's what's being talked about here, but I want to show you in Scripture, I want to prove to you in Scripture that that's not what this is suggesting that we are not to become the servant of everyone. 
In fact, in essence, what I believe this scripture is trying to communicate to us is that we are not to become this, to, to become great does not mean to become the servant of everyone. It means to become the greatest servant of all. The greatest servant of all. Not the greatest servant necessarily to all, but the greatest servant of all. Now, what does that mean? And why is that different? I am serving people, but I want to suggest to you that I'm not to become the servant of people. Because when I become the servant of people, then I am their servant. They are the ones that are determining what I'm to do and what I'm not to do. And I become the servant of everyone. Everyone and their opinion and their perspective and their idea and their value system becomes what I now am serving. But I don't think that's what Jesus is suggesting to us. Because we're going to find that we're to become a servant in the same way that Christ has become a servant. Well, what did Christ say in this last verse we read? Go back with me to Luke 22. Luke 22 and verse 26, uh, verse 27. Jesus says, For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who who serves. In other words, Jesus says, we tend to think of greatness as being the one who is sitting at the table, but Jesus says, I want to redefine greatness as the one who is serving. But here is the critical question in what we're going to consider tonight. Is the question is, who was Jesus serving and who are we to serve? I will say to you unequivocally, the road to greatness or the road to glory is service. It is not going about to establish your own greatness, going about to determine, here's what I want out of life. Here's what I'm going to become. Here's what I'm going to grab for. This is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to lord it over and move everything out of my way that doesn't allow me to become what I want to become. This is not the road to greatness. But I also want to tell you the road to greatness is not becoming what everybody else tells you you need to become or becoming the servant of everyone. Though I do believe we're to become a servant to everyone, but not a servant of everyone. What's the difference? Jesus says, I'm among you as one who serves. Well, let's look for a minute at this idea of who it was that Christ was serving. Look at Matthew, and I'm sorry, let's go, let's go now over to Philippians. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Very familiar passage of Scripture. But hang in here with me because there's some real revelation here God, I believe, wants to give us. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5, Paul the Apostle is writing to the church in Philippi, and he says in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross." Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now notice this. Jesus made himself a bondservant. He was God and equal with the Father, but he made himself a bondservant, and he became obedient. But here's the question. Who was he the bondservant of? Was he the bondservant of men? And to whom did he become obedient? Did he become obedient to men? Let's look at this for just a minute. I want you to go into the Old Testament with me for, for a moment. And I want us to look at Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42 is going to begin to tell us who Jesus was the bondservant of. Service 
and becoming a servant, a descent is the way to glory. Jesus humbled himself to death and death on a cross, and therefore he's highly exalted. But to whom or who was he serving? Well, in Isaiah 42, verse 1, it says, Behold, my servant. God is speaking about Christ. This is a messianic prophecy. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth, and he will not fail, nor be discouraged, until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Now, who was Jesus serving? He, the, the Bible says, God speaking, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. Jesus, his pathway to glory was to become a servant. But who was he serving? He was the servant of his father to men. Let me say that again. Jesus was the servant of his father to men. He was not the servant of men. He was the servant of his father. He served his father by serving towards or to men. Now, let's look further at this. I want you to see that this is throughout the scripture. I want you to look at Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 and verse 26. This is going to have a real personal application for you in just a minute. Just hang in there with me, okay? In Acts chapter 3, verse 26, now the apostle Peter is he's speaking on the day of the resurrection, of the day of Pentecost, rather. In verse 26, he says, To you first, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning every one of you away from your iniquities. He's, this is, he's preaching about the resurrection of Christ. And what he says to the Jews is, to you first, to the Jews first, God raised up his servant Jesus. Who was Jesus serving? He was serving his father. But what was the result of his service to his father was the blessing of men. His, he raised up his servant Jesus and sent him to bless you. Who sent him to bless you? The father sent Jesus to bless men in turning every one of you away from your iniquities. Again, he was the servant of God. He was a servant to men. This is so important. I want you to hear this with me. To be a Christian and a follower of Christ is not to be a servant of men, but a servant to men. And to be a servant of God. How did Jesus become a servant of the Father? Jesus laid down his life to let the Father express his will through him. His life, the Father's life, is what Jesus lived to express. The Father's will was what he lived to express. He did not come to serve what men wanted him to do. He came to serve only what the Father was calling him to do. But in serving and being the servant of his father, he became a servant to men because it was his father who sent him to men. But it wasn't men he was serving, it was his father he was serving. Men were the recipient, the benefactors. They were the beneficiaries of Christ's service to his father. I want you to look with me, for example, uh, over in the book of John. If you look at John chapter 6 and verse 38, John 6 verse 38, Jesus is speaking and he says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus did not come to do the will of men, and he did not come to do his own will, he came to do the will of the one who sent him. In other words, for Christ, he knew that the path to glory, 
to being returned to the glory he had with the Father before the worlds began was the path of serving the Father's purpose by not doing his own will, not coming up with his own plan, and not lording it over others, but also not letting others lord it over him, not letting others determine what he was supposed to do, not letting the emergencies and the immediacies and the and the um, demands of men determine his course of service, but to live in obedience to his father's plan and purpose and will. He became the servant to men by being the servant of his father. And men became the beneficiaries of his unwavering commitment to serve not men and not himself, but to serve his father's purpose. Now this is so important to understand because this is exactly the same thing that the Father is asking of us. I want you to go with me, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians in chapter 6, and I want us to look at around verse 19. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, it says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and then look at this, and you are not your own, for you have been bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, in your spirit, which are God's. Now, I want you to follow this with me. We, we often hear scriptures and we listen to them through the paradigm of Jesus died for me, now I'm going to live for him. So Jesus did his part, it's up to me now to do my part. The part that Jesus did is he died on the cross, forgave me of my sin, he raised from the dead, now he has bestowed upon me a new beginning and giving me, given me his spirit, and now I'm to go and I am to become the servant to all men and to do everything that men need me to do and to be completely submitted to and surrendered to whatever men need. And, and every need becomes now my calling, whatever men need me to do. In other words, we have reinterpreted, I believe, this word to, uh, to the idea that we are to become the servant of men rather than the servant to men and the servant of Christ. The difference is very different. Because if I'm the servant of men, then men are the ones who are declaring and determining my course of action. But if I'm the servant of Christ to men, then Christ is the one who is working, living, expressing his life through me. I am the servant of Christ. I am yielding to Christ. I am offering myself to Christ. I am submitting myself to Christ. And he then is determining where his actions and activities are meant to happen. Men are not determining that. Christ is determining that in me and through me. Because I'm not my own. And I'm not, I don't belong to men and I don't belong to myself. I belong to God. I have been bought by him at the price of his blood, and I am to glorify him in my body and my spirit, which are his. They belong to him. Look, for example, with me now at what it says over in... Uh, let me just see here real quick where I want to go. Look at 1 Corinthians 7. We're right here at 1 Corinthians 6. Look at 1 Corinthians 7, looking at verse 20. Even to the extent here he's talking about in those days that there were people who were actually physical bond servants to others. But I want you to notice what he says in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 7. Let each one of you remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave or a bond servant? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, use that freedom. Verse 22, for he was called is in the Lord while he is a slave is the Lord's free man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. 
Look at verse 23. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. In other words, he's saying here, if, you were, if you're a bond servant when you got saved and you can't get your freedom, then serve Christ in that situation. If you're a free man when you're saved, then serve Christ as his servant. But don't become the slave of men because you've been bought with a price. Verse 23, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. But when you're serving to a man, you're, you're the servant of the Lord. He may be the beneficiary, but he is not the one that you are serving. You are serving the Lord, and he is the one to whom your service is being given. I hope this is making sense to you because it's going to become even richer in just a minute. Now look with me. For example, let's look over at Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3 and verse 22. Here he's speaking about bond servants. And these are physical bond servants, people who are indentured servants to another person. He says in verse 22, Bond servants, obey in all things your masters, according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And then look what he says in verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Even an indentured servant, even though they, he is calling them to be obedient to their leader or master, he says, but know this, that you are doing it to the Lord, not to them. You are the servant of the Lord, not of them. And he says, you're receiving a reward from the Lord, whether they ever reward you or not, for you are serving the Lord Christ. What is he telling us here? There's no question that the path to glory or greatness is service. But if we interpret that to mean that we are becoming the servant of all men so that all men are determining what we're to do and every need we're to respond to as a call and we are supposed to respond to whatever any man asks us to do, then we're missing something very important. Because the fact is we are not the servant of men, we are the servant of Christ. And we are the servant to men. Men are the beneficiaries of our service. I want you to look with me at another verse of Scripture. Look with me at Matthew chapter 4. And I want you to see this in, a, in this context. I want you to think about what we've been discussing. And then in just a moment, I'm going to pull this together in a, in a way that I believe can be very, very liberating and very revealing to you. Matthew chapter 4, and we're looking now at Jesus being tempted by the devil in the wilderness after fasting for 40 days. It says, now we're into the, the second uh, temptation, uh, or the, the third temptation, I'm sure, yeah, I think we are. But it says here, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain. This is verse 8 of Matthew 4. The devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Now let that sink in for a minute. The enemy was offering Jesus a pathway to glory that was an ascent into glory. I can suggest to you there are two ways to ascend into glory. One is to lord it over people, take matters into your own hand, take control and make yourself great. That's one way that people try to get there. Another is 
to become what everybody wants you to be, to stir no pots, to make no waves, to do nothing that offends anybody, to be completely at their, at their mercy and, and, and let them determine what is your life supposed to be like. And you live your whole life at the behest of men and they set your agenda they determine what you need to be doing and and in all of your attempts you're always seeking their approval always seeking their acceptance always seeking them to applaud what you're doing some people think that's what jesus was suggesting that we become the servant of all if we want to be great we have to be the servant of all but I want to suggest to you that the only way true greatness happens is not by taking the shortcut of man's approval or taking matters into my own hand and I'm going to make myself great. It comes by worshiping the Lord your God, him only, him only shall you serve. Now, let me tell you something about serving the Lord. When you serve the Lord only, I'm going to guarantee you that the result of your service to the Lord is going to be that men are going to be served. But it is not them you are serving. It is the Father that you're serving. It's Christ's life in you that is taking control. Now, why do I think this is so important? Because I want you to hear something I wrote in my notes. We serve everyone best. Listen to this. We serve everyone best when we serve Christ alone. In other words, the best service we can ever provide to any person is to serve Christ only to let our lives become surrendered to and yielded to his life such that we become as much as possible surrendered to his will and his will only to serve him only to realize we are not our own we've been bought with a price we're to glorify god in our body and our spirit which are the lord's to worship him and to serve him only, him, thou, him only shalt thou serve, to bow entirely our life to his, such that we become the greatest servant of all by becoming the slave, the bond servant, completely surrendered to Christ's life allowing him to make the decisions, him to make the determinations, him to set the, the, the pace, him to determine the outcome, and him to be the one through whom the work and the ministry that we do is energized and empowered. When we serve him only, we serve men best. We become the greatest servant that men can have by serving not men, but Christ. And when we serve Christ by yielding our life, our mind, our thoughts, our will to him, by stop trying to live our life for Christ by serving men, but to let Christ live his life through us by serving Christ, yielding to him. Jesus was leaving us an example. He said, who's the greatest? Isn't it the one who sits at the table? Not the one who serves, but I am among you as one who serves. But who was he serving? Was he serving men? He was serving his father. He was his father's servant. He was completely and totally yielded to his father's life. The words he spoke, he said, they weren't his own. They were the words the Father gave him to speak. The works he did were not his own. They were the words the Father, the works he saw the Father doing. 
then what would it mean if, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you, Jesus told his disciples when he was leaving, except that in the same way that the best way I can serve men is to serve the Father, the best way I can serve men is to serve Christ, to let Christ's will, his words, his works be what is expressed through me, not what I want, not what I come up with, not my own plans of glory or greatness, or my own definitions of what that means, but neither is it what men would make of me, what they would want me to be. You know, I wasn't going to read this verse, but I want you to look with me at Matthew 11. We're already there in Matthew. Look at Matthew 11. I referred to this passage of scripture when we were at this retreat that I just came back from uh, this last weekend. But this passage of scripture seems so um, relevant right now. Listen to this verse. This is Jesus speaking. He says in verse 15, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I liken this generation? It, it is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their companions and saying, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned to you, and you did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a wine-bibber a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is justified by her children. And what was Jesus saying? He was saying the world, men, they're trying to get me to do things. So they pipe a, a, a little song for me and they want me to dance. But they get frustrated because the world says, we piped a song for you, but you didn't dance. So then they play a dirge or a lament and he wouldn't mourn. They couldn't get John the Baptist and they couldn't get Jesus to do the things that they wanted him to do through their demands and their expectations and their requirements. Why? Because Jesus was not here to serve men and be the servant of men. He was here to be the servant of his father to men. Men would be the beneficiaries of his service. Let me give you one more example of this. Peter, for example, had a need, and his need was for Jesus not to go to the cross. He didn't like the idea of Jesus dying. He didn't like the idea of Jesus being betrayed. He didn't like the idea of Jesus being tried. He didn't like the idea of Jesus dying. And so when Jesus told the disciples what was going to happen to him, Jesus uh, Peter came and, and rebuked Jesus and said, this shall never happen to you, Jesus. Now, he had a, a need. My need is for you not to go to the cross. My need is for you not to, uh, not to be, you know, abandon me. But what did Jesus do? Jesus said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, because you're thinking like men, not like God. Well, why would Jesus say that? Because he didn't come to serve men. He came to serve God. He came to serve his Father and men were the beneficiaries of his service. Well, what had happened if, if Jesus had chosen to let men determine what he was to do? Men to establish his agenda. Men to be the ones who he was serving, their interests, their plans, their expectations of him. He would have never gone to the cross. No, you see, we serve men best when we serve Christ alone. The best act of love and service I can ever do for anyone in my life is to serve the Lord only. Because men will often ask of us, and if we're their servant, we will respond, but they will often ask of us something in contradiction or in opposition to what Christ is asking of us. At that point, a decision has to be made. Yes, Lord, serve us. Serving is the way to glory. Down is the way up. Less of me is the way to glory and greatness in your eyes. But it's 
who I'm serving that is critical to the process. I am not to serve myself. We kind of intuitively know that. But I want to tell you something. We are not called to serve even a cause. We are called to serve Christ. When Jesus was on earth, many men tried to elicit from him an engagement in a cause. But Jesus wasn't here to be obedient to a cause. He was here to be obedient to the Father's life within him. And in the same way, we are called to be obedient to the life of Christ within. When he became a bondservant, when he became obedient, he became obedient even to the point of death. Even on the eve of his death, he was saying, not my will, but thine be done. Why? Men would have done anything. I mean, Peter was ready to cut off the ears of, of the, the soldiers to, to protect Jesus from the cross. But you see, Jesus wasn't here to serve and be a servant of men. And he knew that if he didn't go to the cross, Peter would go to hell. He knew that many of the people who were eliciting and soliciting him to engage in this or in that were in fact taking him off track of the highest good for them. So his highest level of service to them was not to serve them, but to serve his father. And they now became the recipients of Christ's highest service, which was to turn them from their iniquities, from their sins, from their bondage and dominion of the enemy, and turn them to the Lordship of Christ. He had to fight their will to give them his service. Now, how does that reflect on me today? What it means for me today is that for me, the path to greatness from God's perspective, the path to glory from God's perspective, is that I diminish and Christ increases. My will is becoming less, his will is becoming more, but let me also say that men's will is not the determining factor for my service. Because men will often settle. The Jews would have settled for Rome to be overthrown while they remain dead in their sins and trespasses. But Jesus didn't come to fulfill their will. He came to fulfill the will of his Father, which was to overthrow the darkness of the kingdom of, of the enemy and to establish the kingdom of Christ in them. Such a higher service, such a higher service than what men would have settled for or expected or demanded of Christ. Can I tell you the same is true of you? In this world, if you become the servant of men for Christ, you become the servant of men for Christ, then men are determining your service and you're doing it for Jesus. But if you become the servant of Christ for men, then he is determining the actions. He is determining the highest good. He is determining what needs to be done to serve men. And then the highest good is what's achieved. The best thing I can do, Jesus said, no greater love has a man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. Can I tell you that you living your life for Christ is not in his greatest good? Um, it, it is not in the greatest good of man either for you to live your life for men. It's for you to live your life in Christ Christ living his life in you and then men become the beneficiaries of your obedience and service to the Father. And men will be served. Make no mistake about it. Men will be greatly served, greatly served by your surrendered obedience to Christ in you, the hope of glory. The beauty of that is 
You're not serving everyone, though you may be the servant of everyone. You are the servant of him to them. And they may benefit. I will say everyone you serve when you're serving Christ will benefit from your serving him only. They will all be better off for you not being their servant, but his. So it's an interesting dilemma, and yet part of this transformative paradigm is for us to come to realize that we serve everyone best when we serve only one. That's true husbands and wives. It's true fathers and sons and daughters. It's true for employers and employees. It's true for bond servants and slaves. We serve others best when we serve him only. I want us to come to a close tonight in prayer. Lord Jesus, there truly is only one calling on my life. It is that Christ in me becomes my hope of glory. It is that I live, nevertheless, not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is when I die, accept that death, and my life becomes hidden with Christ in God, and then Christ's life begins to appear, and then I appear with him in glory. It is true, Lord, that I am called to be the servant to everyone, but I'm called to be the servant of only one. Let me believe and come to understand I serve everyone best when I serve only one. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that this word will kind of percolate in your heart for a little bit. What, what I really feel like God wants to do is deliver us from the millions of things we think we're supposed to do for the Lord and realize what we are supposed to do is to allow him, moment by moment, step by step, day by day, to determine our acts Many people will be the beneficiary of it. You'll serve many, many people for him because you're the servant of him. Bless you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.